Welcome everyone to our virtual event today. Good morning, good noon, good evening, especially for attendees uh, in Indonesia. Um, now, before, before we start, uh, let me just uh, first uh, acknowledge uh, that York University acknowledges its presence uh, on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as the Karonto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the huron wendat and the Metis. It is now home to many indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Misasagas of the new credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the dis with one spoon wampum belt covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. Uh, today's event is presented by the York Center for Asian Research as part of the Climate Change Month uh, at York University. Uh, I, will, I will put uh, the link of that event uh, in the chat uh, later on. Now, the title of the event is Thinking Like an Archipelago, Design and Spatial Practice uh, for Climate Change Adaptation in Indonesia. And maybe later on with some discussions on the case of Philippines as well, because the notion of archipelago, as we know, you know it captures the whole maritime uh, region of Southeast Asia. Now, this wonderful title, yeah, Thinking Like an Archipelago, is actually provided yeah, by a friend, yeah, Etin Turpin, uh, who co-authored with Nasim Matani, our, our presenter today, yeah, uh, a film installation called uh, The Same River uh, Twice. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not quite sure uh, if Etin is with us today, but I do hope uh, he is with us today. He's not uh, listed as a speaker, uh, but he's our special guest. Yeah, I, will, I will invite uh, Etin to make comments uh, and to engage uh, in the conversation. Uh, and in any case, thank you, Atin. Uh, if you are there for, for the title, uh, and, and if you are there you know, for here with us uh, today to, to share your thoughts. Um, and I also almost forget the incredible photo that you see in the poster. Um, that is also uh, provided by uh, Dr. Turpin as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a heartbreaking or you can say mind-blowing image uh, of an Indonesian city. Yeah, I, I think it is probably Jakarta. Yeah. Uh, and, and we use that uh, for the poster. And, and so thanks again, uh, 18, for that. Now, I want to thank our speakers today, uh, Professor Teti Argo, uh, Nasin Mahtani, and our discussion, uh, Ria Joanna Dukusin. I will introduce them uh, when it is their turn uh, to speak. Uh, so the format uh, would be Teddy and Nasim will give a short presentations of their uh, materials uh, and, and tease out you know, some issues for, for discussion. And then Ria will offer some comments uh, and, and raise some questions yeah, for Teddy, for Nasim, and, and for us as well, for everyone. Yeah. We hope this will be turned into a kind of a more like conversational uh, session. Um, and also, of course, I will not forget to ask uh, Dr. Aitin Tupin to offer uh, thoughts and, and questions if he's around. Then we'll open uh, the floor for discussion and questions. Uh, but, but on the way, as you listen to the talk, uh, please feel free to write down your questions uh, in, in the chat. Okay. Now let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Teti Argo from the Urban Rural uh, regional planning uh, at the School of Architecture uh, and Architecture Planning and Public Policy. So it's a very interesting, you know, school which combine architecture planning and public policy. Yeah, at Institute of Technology in Bandung. Yeah, we call it ITB, uh, Indonesia. Uh, Professor Argo, yeah, Teddy and I, we are, you know, somehow pretty connected because of our uh, past, present uh, connections. Yeah, we can call it the Indonesian connection 
the UBC connection, yeah, and now the York connection. Uh, that he holds an MES, Master of Environmental Studies, yeah, which he obtained in the early uh, 1990s yeah, before pursuing her PhD uh, at University of British Columbia. Um, and she told me that her supervisor was Professor Paul Wilkinson, yeah, who passed away, uh, I think, in, in the late 2021. Um, and so some, some of the uh, attendees here probably recognize uh, Tati. Yeah, I, I saw Ted, Professor Ted Spence, just put in the chat saying hi uh, to Tati. That's very nice. Uh, and I don't know if Philip is here. Yeah. They are friends. So Professor Argo has published extensively uh, on environmental issues covering planning and governance, community resilience, and social ecological relations. She also served as a member of Indonesia's representative uh, in an engagement uh, with the UN Habitat New Urban Agenda 2016 to 2036. Yeah, and and that is involved in, in the formulations of the country's report uh, of 2021. Um, and so the title of Teddy's talk is uh, Taking Charge of the Extreme, Can Planning and Governing Climate Change Adaptation Help the Communities? Yeah. Uh, so I would like to turn this forum over uh, to, book, to book Teddy. Uh, my title more or less is about the extreme event or extreme uh, weather event that happening in Indonesia uh, and it's about how planning and government governing the climate change adaptation help the community who are affected by this kind of event. Um, now, um, Indonesia probably is well known as a supermarket of event of a disaster. <laughs> what I mean by that is that, you know, you can say uh, different type of disaster and you will find it in Indonesia, except some of the disaster that is related to the uh, to the seasonal uh, thing, yeah, such as uh, 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 ice storm, et cetera. But uh, so we are pretty good and uh, putting out uh, planning and management of disaster up to the point where disaster become an extreme event. Uh, as was mentioned uh, lately uh, about how to deal with disaster if it is part of a climate change. So uh, some disaster actually uh, uh, have become uh, intense in its exposure and its uh, in its orientation and in number of people who are affected and that's uh, that would that type is uh, such as uh, floods, uh, landslide, wildfire. Those are the type of disaster that is happening in Indonesia and it uh, reaches to a different level of uh, event. And on the right hand side, you can sort of see how the houses are being affected by floods. And if you look at the walls, then the walls can show uh, what was uh, the level of uh, floods in the past. Uh, and this is the, uh, been taken uh, during the time when the floods uh, has already went down. But also there is increasing exposure to, in, to new types of disaster, the types that previously in the past is not at the top of uh, the communities. Um, cyclone, for example, that tend to happen in the east part of Indonesia these days uh, happening towards the um, middle part as well as towards the west part. The picture on the right hand side, for example, showing off the type of hills or ice uh, uh, that uh, is part of the uh, of the rain uh, rainy season in uh, Indonesia, and that's pretty uh, that's pretty recent. So it was a late one, and also we in a situation there are areas that previously uh, declared as non disaster prone that right now become more disaster prone, such as inland cities, flatlands, including areas that is considered um, uh, fertile. Uh, now, by uh, seeing it as an extreme event, extreme events also means that it happens at the larger magnitude, it happens suddenly, so it's not a slow onset type of disaster, it becomes a high onset uh, type of disaster. Um, the community cannot wait for the government or other entities to help them dealing with the disaster. And the picture on the right hand side mentioning uh, about uh, taking in, they're the one who taking charge of disaster because of the type 
uh, of event. And on the right hand side, what so far the government has done to deal with this extreme event and to help with the communities. Um, the type of pipeline of information that were given to the uh, communities uh, shift. Previously, it was dealt through the disaster reduction agencies when they mentioned about the uh, disaster that will come to the communities these days. It's the uh, meteorology, um, climatology, and geophysic agencies that take uh, front uh, part of the, uh, of the uh, um, uh, warning system. Yeah. Uh, the right hand side, although it's in, it is in Bahasa Indonesia, it's in Indonesian language. This is the type that was uh, put out by them, uh, including in it is the uh, whether it's type of um, uh, high, the level of the highs is that you have to get ready, you have to. Uh, uh, to move out of the area. Uh, Siaga means that you're sort of uh, aware, uh, aware that it's happening and it shows where is the location uh, uh, at the level of district. And on the bottom, it also shows the risk matrix, uh, means that uh, whether the risk is high, which is shown through the color of red, or it is a green, which is show the color of green that shows the bottom part. So this kind of risk communication being put out, uh, increasingly being done by the uh, the meteorology agency or the weather agencies uh, instead of the uh, disaster risk reduction agencies. Now, um, what happens with the uh, disaster management in Indonesia? I'll give you a little bit of an overview uh, since what uh, since disaster of uh, 2004 in Aceh. Um, since the uh, uh, level of success has uh, been noted uh, when uh, the Indonesian government deal with the disaster in Aceh, uh, we have become more intensive in promoting how to engage in disaster more in a systematic and uh, more uh, widespread ways. Uh, first, by following the Kyoto framework and later on by the Sendai framework, we're also increasing the stressing on one, an early warning system, uh, so that when uh, communities uh, affected by disaster, they know uh, how to read that early warning system, and then they know how to act based on that information. So it needs real data and also needs a fast response. Uh, supposedly 50%, if people are uh, panicked, then uh, the response will uh, lead to a more, uh, more casualties. Yeah. And second, uh, because the Indonesian government also introduced Disaster Management uh, Act in 2017s, it start to stress on the preparation towards disaster. It's not just on what happens during the disaster or after the disaster, but also pre-disaster management. And for that, the government has a way of centralize those and then uh, make that happen towards the local level. So it starts with the national level, regional and local level disaster risk management agencies that specifically deal with the disaster and specifically deals with uh, area, uh, disaster prone area as well. Now, uh, not only the agencies, but also the plans. Uh, so the government also put out the plans that would ensure that uh, specifically the agencies engaged in disaster will, uh, will respond when disaster happen and would also like to engage in pre-disaster level. Now, it's not only in the government area, governing areas that it happens, it's also the community uh, activities uh, where disaster prone area uh, we are located in disaster prone area, and it is where they also uh, emphasize. Now, um, many activities on disaster based, uh, community based disaster risk reduction or CBDRR, or uh, some other people would say disaster risk uh, management, uh, uh, implemented by the NGOs, either non profit or humanitarian oriented, then increasingly also uh, on the faith based uh, agencies. Um, or the area where they also engage is also the school base because the school uh, can be affected heavily when a disaster happens during the school uh, hour or 
um, and they don't know what to do when, when it happens. Also, uh, some university are being asked to engage more in such a multidisciplinary approach towards disaster. So uh, like it or not, people who specialize on science, disaster science, this is, uh, this who specialize on um, technology have to be able to uh, also engage with the communities and uh, work together with them. Um, so, uh, at least at this time, um, disaster management in Indonesia agency based is dealing, uh, state based is dealt with uh, three agencies. So the one that specifically deal with disaster is the one that specifically deal with the forest fire and the one that specifically deal with the Board of Weather and Climate and Ge Geophysics. Now, what happens with climate change? Extreme event often called a type of disaster triggered by the climate change. And the form of disaster could be the same, such as flood, such as landslide, but it's uh, uh, induced by a high precip uh, precipitation level. Um, on the climate change, uh, change front, um, it's similar level what's going on because climate change uh, approach tend to be, uh, tend to start from international level, goes down to the national level. So the national level, um, work intensely to reinterpret what happens or what type of data that happening is at the global level to be used at the at the national level. So at least for the last ten years, the national level uh, has been trying to dealing with the regional modeling has been has tried to deal with what happens in Indonesia, which is kind of a natural science uh, heavy uh, types of data. Uh, but they did not shy away from the fact that they have to engage the community with the realization on the impact of climate change, especially in agriculture sector, uh, forestry sectors, and also energy sectors. So um, action plans are being developed. Uh, at the national level and at the community level, uh, especially for agriculture level, School of Climate Field, and then a, a directorate that deal with uh, when the starting season for uh, for harvesting, when the starting season for seeding activities is also being reorganized in order to recognize uh, the changing pattern of the climate. Um, and other area at the community level, uh, if, uh, if you're a bit familiar with Indonesia, there is a term kampung that we often use. And this is kind of a high density community where people live. And there is now a program that also has happened for the last 10 years as a climate change uh, protection kind of kampung, or it's called a program kampung iklim. Yeah. Uh, the main idea is to ensure that they have a food security, to ensure that they are uh, uh, waste uh, waste uh, management is being done properly as well as the energy and transportation issues because those are the type of thing that will influence how the emission from the kampung will uh, will contribute towards the uh, the overall emission in the city or in the uh, settlement now um the event that are recognized here is that um, we increasingly see that the type of disaster or hazard for some scientists who like to uh, learn about it increasingly become a multi-hazard and there is flood and suddenly there will be landslide and that suddenly there will be housing records that you cannot build on that anymore if there is a storm there is a storm they would increasingly happening a flood and then there is suddenly job losses especially if if your job is a farmer or is in an open field and that multi-hazard is something that we um, didn't, or uh, I saw in some researchers didn't do uh, much on because they sometimes uh, concentrate on one type or uh, two types of disasters only. Looking at the multi-hazard, then we know that uh, we have to work uh, in a way that uh, cater to the specific location. The second type, uh, the second situation is that uh, if there is a direct impact from that event, also there is indirect impact, including uh, uh, jobs and the loss of uh, uh, the loss of job and health situation. Uh, um, health facilities at the local level uh, record uh, that the health situation, especially in, in infectious disease, happens uh, not right after, but after a while, and it's uh, after the disaster happens. And it often because of the basic infrastructure and basic service needed, such as clean water, toilet, 
um, sanitation, other type of sanitation uh, is not adequate to deal with the communities. And lastly, chain of event and create damage is that a larger population and a larger re region are being affected. And those who least equipped to recover and adapt will uh, carry the burden. And we start to see also a level of displacement. For example, in the case of Palu, one of the city in Indonesia, who's in 2018 uh, uh, got um, um, earthquake. And some of the area leads to uh, what they call liquid liquefaction. So uh, it's absorbed houses to make it into, uh, to uh, go into under the, uh, the to go into the ground, and it leads to people has to this uh, this has to move out of the area and uh, lightly go uphill uh, to the area that is uh, safer and higher foot foot price. Uh, can be considered as a result of this extreme consideration. Some of the notes of extreme weather event is the shift in um, how a risk is being communicated. Previously, risk is being communicated by the communities, risk is being communicated by the local leader. Right now, we often have to hear from the meteorology agencies because it involves more uh, uh, scientific data uh, when they try to predict uh, when it's going to happen. And the second, um, monitoring extreme weather include agriculture that will affect our livelihood because it affects the food supply. Uh, monitoring a forest fire, it affects how the pollution level might happen in our city, despite the fact that our cities might lo be located far away from uh, forest fire. And in some cases, for the context of Indonesia, the loss of biomass, which we often being told that we did too much deforestation, uh, peatlands that only uh, exist in uh, a particular part of the area, and also melting uh, ice. So we see that the extreme weather pattern um, is related to also related to precipitation and uh, the leading uh, uh, types of uh, disaster. I cannot give you some uh, statistical data. As I look at the statistical data, some of the data are still uh, not being exposed to uh, the public. The second thing, because of the extreme uh, weather uh, event, there is an increasing role for the local disaster management agencies to concentrate or to uh, to concentrate themselves on the early warning system again, back from uh, dealing with the pre-disaster uh, situation, because uh, past data might not give us an indication about what's going on or what's going to happen at the local level. And so uh, local disaster management agencies at the local level um, increasingly involved in uh, providing equipment, mo mobilization of the community members, as well as uh, mobilization resources, including from the private sector, in order to engage in uh, EWS. Uh, on the planning front, we also realize the fact that the role of planning uh, governments become more important because even if uh, this weather, uh, uh, pat, uh, uh, even if this disaster are affected by the weather pattern, it also, when it becomes a disaster, the magnitude of it affected by what kind of building you live in, what kind of standard that currently are affected, uh, how land use uh, plan is being enforced and how the policy is being uh, managed. Those are an important factor that contribute to the um, uh, damage that happens in, uh, after disaster. So communities are uh, faced with this situation where they have to deal with it themselves again. Uh, after years and years, uh, they learn about pre-disaster management, deal with the pre preparedness, engage in skill and drills, engage in uh, improving, uh, for example, how youth can be part of uh, disaster risk reduction. Now they have to deal with the preparedness, not only for the slow onset type of disaster, but also for the fast onset type of disaster. And they also uh, create some organization that help them out specifically with evacuation and cleaning squad. This is a type of activities that we have to deal with, but uh, when we move away towards pre-disaster, cleaning and evacuation uh, would be uh, would not be the first one that we have to um, we have to manage. Yeah. Uh, 
because preparedness means that you uh, also uh, manage how to uh, store your resources, how to uh, move, uh, where you're going to keep your children and where you're going to keep your uh, senior citizen. And the second, the accumulation of knowledge in the pre-disaster preparedness might also not be useful again in dealing with the extreme weather pattern, especially with the past mechanism of adequate, there is a past past mechanism of evacuation that is no longer adequate, and also the need of uh, various communities to engage in uh, extreme weather pattern. So the communities now start to see how uh, their settlement is uh, helping them or uh, deprive them of a uh, safety. Uh, going back to the, uh, to the recognition that uh, basic infrastructure should be in working order. Uh, there is a recognition, for example, about the retention Point. There is a recognition that, that uh, the community should engage in a type of insurance uh, so that when it happens, they have a level of safety uh, financially to deal with the disaster. And also recognizing that the cohort group uh, uh, act differently when an uh, extreme event happens to them, including in, um, from the health perspective. Um, now, um, how the community overcoming the extreme event? Uh, in one of the cases that lately I, uh, I monitor, this is related to uh, extreme event happening in an area where there is a mosque, where there is uh, schools. And uh, they actually have to act not only as, as a community member, but sometimes they have to act as a, as a community that help other people, communities that open the door so that children can be safe, community that trying to uh, store, uh, engage in storing uh, some of the food that they have to keep for the next couple of days. Uh, but also they recognize the fact that this is a change. This is ch change. Uh, this is a situation that they uh, have to deal with and they might have to deal with in the future. Um, uh, I haven't found uh, communities that recognize that disaster is only one time deal. Uh, disaster is a continuing situation that they have to deal uh, in the future, but also recognize that they have tending resources to deal with them. So continually uh, reinvent themselves and reorganize themselves has become a uh, type of way for them to deal with the impact of the uh, the the uh, the extreme weather event. And I often mention only about floods because I guess uh, we will talk much more uh, about flood. On the picture on the right hand side, it's a it's a blend of floods that was caused by uh, precipitation, but also by the dam being broken. Uh, that leads to not an inundation, inundation but tend to be a, a type of, of, of flash, a flash flood. Um, um, now, intervention, with such a uh, extra sorry, but Teddy, um, you only have two more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be done in a minute, hopefully. Thank this you. is the slide, the last slide. But thank you uh, now with the type of extreme event like right now are we going to be constantly in a response mode not being able to plan ahead not being able to prepare ahead so that when it happens uh, or the the damage that that affecting um, the communities will be will be less um, yes we deal with the new event but the way we deal seems to be we still use the old response. What I mean by that is we still use uh, the type of response that uh, mainly haven't used technological advance, uh, mainly haven't uh, involved uh, with some findings from, from, uh, from the scientific communities. And even when the findings is, um, is included, uh, it might not um, uh, adapt to the local situation. Uh, and yes, there is a sense that uh, we are now in a, a square one again, uh, because the effect of not only the fast onset, but also the slow onset leads to um, uh, various problems or various type of disaster happening at one time. Uh, 
Um, now there is also a limited involvement uh, of the government because of limited bureaucracy authorities. Uh, the authorities will limit when uh, particular uh, agencies will engage with the community over the certain thing. You know, there is a social ministries agencies that deal with the uh, with uh, social work and uh, they also in the end do some uh, uh, youth-based activities that uh, then they will have a different a different uh, different role. Uh, there are more roles on the NGOs as well as the outside communities but also this become back to square one. Uh, uh, usually the outside community would engage in more of a charity work. What is needed at the time they will deliver. Um, more volunteering work, more financial work come to from the communities through the NGO to deal with this situation but also during the disaster or in response mode when it becomes to post disaster rehabilitation and reconstruction which require more money that is when uh, the money is no longer uh, available so in the end I would say that uh, effort to combine between the approach uh, of disaster risk reduction or management with uh, the extreme weather event um, has to be met. Uh, that means including the climate change consideration as well as hydrometeorological consideration into disaster uh, risk reduction. And that also means working together between agencies to willing to, uh, uh, to, to make it happen in the communities. And lastly, uh, the communities itself has to adopt a mode of preparedness in a comprehensive sense. They should be able to provide food. They should be able to engage in search and rescue. They should be able to engage in data, uh, data mining as well, data storage as well, data reading. And uh, they should be engaged in infrastructure uh, uh, recovery uh, when it needed to be uh, to be done. And I guess with this uh, with this presentation, uh, hopefully it will give you an idea of what to be discussed in uh, in in later uh, later part. Thank you, Pak Abidin. Thank you, everybody. For the... Thank you very much, um, Buteti. And I'm sorry to cut short your, your presentation. Uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful uh, set of presentation, uh, giving us a little map you know, of the whole complex relationship between the state uh, and, and the communities, vertical and also the horizontal uh, relationships. And it is most appropriate now for us to actually move on uh, to our second uh, presenter. Yeah? Let me introduce uh, Nasin Mahtani. Uh, Nasin is a designer, researcher, and director of Yayasan Peta Bencana, which is in English, is called Disaster Map uh, Indonesia. Now, Yayasan Peta Bencana is a Southeast Asian-based uh, NGO, uh, and it is very committed you know, to come up with a way yeah, to, to a way to allow all residents yeah, during disasters yeah, or in time of emergency, you know, to, to cope with the situation. Yeah, and in and especially in the end, it would really try to enable a sort of a more equitable forms of climate uh, adaptation. Uh, and, and they are using a very interesting sort of a tool, yeah, something that is open, uh, you know, verified information. We will learn more uh, from Nasin and also from uh, Etin uh, about uh, this tool. Uh, and together with uh, Etin Turpin, Nasin is working on software and related uh, climate change adaptation infrastructure. Yeah, they are preparing a new book uh, called Software for the City Yet to Come. Yeah. So Nasin will present the movie, the film that they made together, yeah, the same river uh, twice. Uh, but I think Nasin will give us a context first uh, before showing uh, the short uh, film. Uh, let me now turn this over uh, to Nasin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avedin. Um, and thanks also for everyone for being here. Thanks, Imutati, for your presentation. I think it provides a perfect segue into um, some of the work that we're doing as well on community-based adaptation and this question of are we always going to be in a response mode and what does that mean? Um, what does that mean to live with uncertainty as all of us are experiencing in different uh, ways right now? Um, before I start, I also want to acknowledge that uh, the work I'll be sharing today is a collective work um, with uh, many different people 
And of course, very glad that Etienne is able to be here today. Um, the work that I'll be presenting is a shared work that Etienne co-founded with Dr. Thomas Holderness. Um, and I've been now working with the team for several years in the continued development of this work of, uh, clim of community-led climate adaptation in Southeast Asia um, and um, expanding further. Um, and so to start, I, I just want to share a short story about what it means to live with uncertainty and um, provide some framing as to what it might mean to think like an archipelago, like the title of this event suggests, um, by first bringing us to a volcano on one of the most densely populated islands in Indonesia. Um, so Mount Merapi is one of Indonesia's most active volcanoes. And the volcano was dormant for several years. Um, but in 2010, there was a historic eruption. And that triggered some of the villages who are living on the slopes of the volcano to start to adapt um, different ways of arranging themselves to live with new or renewed uncertainties that come from living um, on the inheritance of this geology. Um, so there's several different slopes, uh, several different villages who live along the various slopes, each of which have their own customs and traditions. Um, but we spent a lot of time with the residents on the village of Dallas, uh, which is situated on the eastern slope. Um, and so after 2010, their strategy was to begin a process of strengthening their relationships with the monkeys that live higher up the volcano. Now, many other villages shoot the monkeys because the monkeys steal their crops. Um, but in Dallas, they began feeding the monkeys fruit in order to enter into an alliance with them as kind of a risk reduction strategy. And the reason for this is that the monkeys live closest to the top of the volcano. So when there's a seismic activity, they're some of the first to know that something is going to happen. And uh, even though now at the base of Merapi, there's now a monitoring center with some of the most sophisticated technologies for estimating volcanic and seismic activity, the monkeys are still some of the first to know that something is going to happen. And because the village of Dallas has developed this relationship with them, when the monkeys detect seismic activity, they now run down, run through the village of Dallas because they have no fear of that particular village. And they use this, um, evacuate this a village as an evacuation route. And what this does is that it alerts villagers that something is gonna happen. And so the village of Dallas is now always the first to know when something is about to happen, um, even before the emergency management agency uh, spreads the message, they are the first to know. And they've set up a radio system to alert all of the other villages. And there's a few reasons I share this story, a few things I wanna point out that help to frame the approach of our design practice. One is infrastructures of sense making. Um, how do we read signals in our environments? As we see in the story, residents are often in the best place to recognize even the smallest changes in their environments. And a lot can be gained from paying attention to these forms of knowing that arise from living in a particular place. Um, the second thing I want to point out is the type of alliances we form to extend those methods of sense making. So even with those who have different interests than our own. So the monkeys steal, they're considered a nuisance, but during a disaster, during an eruption, there is an alignment of concern for safety. And so by alliance, we can find mutual ways of living together. And the third is how do we organize ourselves? Because if one villager is going to feed the monkey, that's not gonna develop trust with the monkey community. And so how do we organize ourselves collectively to adapt to highly uncertain environments like we are facing with the climate crisis? Um, and I think these are undeniably spatial research questions. How do we interpret, represent, and use these faculties of sense making to live together? And in terms of what it means to think like an archipelago, we realize then that design is actually a project of working with and creating a relation, creating relations, these alliances, these connections, um, through an understanding that like the volcano, um, all of our environments can't be understood as these single uniform entities, but are actually composed of a lot of different interests, a lot of different constellations that can come together in different ways. Um, and so with that, I bring us then 
um, to Jakarta, where the work we'll share today emerged. So Jakarta is a mega city of 31 million people um, situated on the world's most disaster prone region, um, as Ibu Tati mentioned. Jakarta, um, so flooding has always been a part of this landscape that experiences a seasonal monsoon because it was built on a swampland. Um, but when it was colonized by the Dutch in the 17th century, they decided to turn it into a port. And so, um, that meant that the seasonal monsoon would disrupt economic activities for a period of time. And so the Dutch invented in these large uh, scale canal infrastructures to control the water and to ensure that the weather would not disrupt economic activities. Um, and so we see that this project is to um, move the water to think to where we think it should be, uh, which of course completely transforms the relationship of water with the city, of how people live with water in the city. Um, and this is an inherited infrastructure. Jakarta is now one of the most rapidly urbanizing cities in the world. And that places a lot of pressure on these colonial infrastructures. Um, because of this incredible rate of urbanization in Jakarta and along with uncontrolled groundwater usage, um, Jakarta is also sinking. Um, um, some of you may have heard the headlines of Jakarta as the fastest sinking city in the world. Here in these images, we see the northern edge of Jakarta, where on, on at the northern side, we see the city is actually two meters below sea level, and it's all is, that separates it is this foot wide concrete wall. And so instead of running water down to the sea, um, we have to pump water up and over a seawall <clears throat> to, um, to drain the city's water. And so Jakarta today has over 1,100 kilometers of canals, 400 pumps to manage the flow of water. And with this extensive infrastructural system in place, um, it means that if any point, any of these components fail, if a canal wall breaks, if a pump fails, if the electricity to the pump is cut off, all of this water flushes back into the city. And that's what's been happening in recent years, as we see in this image. Um, where in a time of climate change, what we're experiencing is a greater intensity of water. And so these canal infrastructures aren't able to keep up with that increasing intensity of the climate. And so as a result, they're bursting and breaking under pressure. And most of the major flood disasters in recent years have been a result of infrastructure failure. And um, as Iputati mentioned, these are unexpected, um, causing different types of disasters. Um, but co these colonial ideologies and relations still permeate the city's approach to water management. So right now there are two main um, flood mitigation projects. The first is funded by the World Bank and JICA, um, which is called normalization. Now nor what normalization means is to replace the river's edge um, with concrete edges. Um, of course, this also means displacing all of the communities living along the river. Um, and once again, we see that the strategy is to define this hard edge between the water and the city, saying that we don't have to live with the water, we can completely separate it. Um, the other project is funded, uh, is called the Great Garuda. And this is one I can talk of in length, but I won't. But just briefly, it's designed by the Dutch government and consultancy firms. And it's this infrastructural mega project involving the construction of a new 40 kilometer seawall um, to separate the sinking city from the ocean. And it's estimated to cost 40 billion US dollars, the costs of which will be recovered through real estate developments on uh, reclaimed islands that will be uh, built in the shape of a giant um, mythical eagle called the Garuda. And so as you see in these renderings, all of the, um, all of the buildings in white are um, all of the new islands, new reclaimed islands that will be formed as part of this master plan. Everything in black is what currently exists in Jakarta. Um, but despite the, those images, what we saw when we were filming in December 2019 was um, we saw the collapse of the first 3% of the construction of that seawall you see in this image here. Um, but still the project is continuing and even, and even as it continues in the same year, 
the president made this announcement that because of the increasing flooding and land subsidence, Indonesia would move its capital city from the island of Java to the island of Borneo. One thing I want to highlight is how these projects are framed, and I think it's really pertinent to research practices, um, how we frame contexts, because what these projects identify as problems are actually normal landscape processes. Flooding can be a threat to cities, but it's also a vital link between rivers, floodplains, and deltas. But when the solution, like an engineering project, like these massive projects, it, when that is what defines the problem, then all of the risks of the monsoon are reduced to water entering the city. And other possible responses to the situation are completely excluded. And so I think, um, one of the fundamental questions to start with is how can we engage in challenging landscapes without presuming to solve them? And this perhaps comes from working with a broader definition of expertise eligible to attend to these challenges. And I borrow this um, idea of eligibility from Abdul Malik Simon, whose work has had a profound influence on shaping um, some of our thinking approach where although um, the techno solutionist master planning fantasies are very prescriptive about who qualifies as an expert or who qualifies as a consultant, we actually see that people living most closely with a particular set of challenges, like the residents on Merapi or the residents along the river, actually have very useful ideas about how to deal with them because they've learned to read and pay attention to the environment very closely. And so before the normalization project, Residents living along the river were able to predict the arrival and force of the flood just by noticing certain changes, such as the pattern of eddies or even the color of the river. But normalization has completely destroyed these knowledges because it's completely changed the way flooding happens in the city. And residents say all of the indices by which they learn to read the environment have been completely disrupted by the engineering project. Um, but another concept that Abdul Malik Simon and Edgar Peters discuss in this new pub publication is makeshift. How the majority of people, um, as Ibu Tati mentioned, at the community level are putting together livable forms of habitation that are rarely institutionalized, that are rarely formalized, but these stabilities come from constant efforts on the parts of residents to address questions of where do they need to pay attention to at that moment and where and what forms of alliance they take. And so we see that people adapt with agility and experimentation and paying attention to what they can do and what they have. And this, this agile tactile um, process is sort of fundamental to the approach our work takes where we've been working across scales, working with the widest variety of people and using open source software as a space to bring different ideas and people together to generate new forms of alliances. And so to share the work more explicitly, um, we'd like to play a short film that we produced for the M Plus Museum of Visual Culture in Hong Kong. Um, it's titled The Same River Twice. And I kindly ask um, Alex to help us play the video. <laughs> sort and display disaster reports solicited through social media. Since that time, Peta Benchana has revolutionized emergency response. This is the story of how we converted the noise of social media into a life-saving disaster response system.
Banjir melanda Jabodetabek pada 1 Januari 2020. Hujan yang tanpa henti mengguyur Jakarta. Pusat rumah warga pun terendam Desember. banjir. Jumlah wilayah di Jabodetabek. Banjir besar tak pernah terjadi selama lebih dari 20 tahunan. 50 orang korban tewas akibat banjir Jabodetabek. Ini adalah gambar terkini di daerah Kelapa. Mobil BMW anyut, mobil BMW anyut. Waktu tahun 2013, banjir selantai ini tinggi. Karena hujan gede, itu air laut pasang. Anak saya melahirkan di rumah sakit, fluid, diketek pakai perahu bambu, dibawa ke rumah sakit. Nggak ada yang perlu takutin sih. Yang penting kita yakin aja. Dulu sih pernah ada kejebolan di tanggul, makanya kita tinggiin. Itu mah nggak pengaruh sih, nggak pengaruh. Tapi kalau misalnya kita dari kiriman lagi juga pasti kenal lagi sini. Kita kan bisa ngungsi, bisa kemana. Although flooding is becoming increasingly unpredictable, residents actively share information with each other on social media in order to avoid danger. So we realized if we could collect and structure this data in a useful way, we would have a data source of unprecedented resolution to reduce urban risk. Masyarakat yang tinggal di dekat sungai, pesisir, atau tempat-tempat yang berisiko banjir lainnya paling memahami risiko yang ada di wilayahnya. Namun hal ini mungkin tidak bisa dipahami oleh pemerintah yang mungkin mengetahui cara kerja sistem akan tetapi tidak bisa melihatnya di lapangan karena tidak mengalaminya sehari-hari. There are certain types of knowledge that can only come from living in a particular place. Residential knowledge is local, site sensitive and attentive to environmental change. We believe residents must be involved in strategic planning and their knowledge of local conditions must be integrated into disaster reduction effort. Although information is the most important resource in a disaster, it requires attentive, patient design to integrate formal and informal data sources into one holistic system. Peta Bencana is the first platform of its kind to produce real-time disaster maps using both crowdsourced reporting and government agency validation. The free and open source platform was born out of Jakarta's extremely rapid urbanization, extreme weather events, and also its incredibly high usage of social media. To transform the noise of social media into actionable information, our team designed Cognicity open source software. How it works is that we use humanitarian chatbots to automatically respond to any post that mentions the word flood. And we ask residents to confirm their situation by submitting a flood report. These reports are immediately plotted on a live web-based map in real time and anyone has access to this information in order to understand the situation. Ini hal ini penting. Peta bencana memberikan informasi tentang update kejadian banjir di Jakarta. Tujuannya apa? Supaya masyarakat itu tahu di mana lokasi-lokasi yang sedang terjadi banjir. Sehingga harapannya masyarakat itu bisa menghindari daerah-daerah tersebut ataupun bisa memberikan informasi kepada masyarakat yang ingin berpartisipasi jika ingin membantu ataupun ingin berperan dalam penanganan banjir tersebut. Kami mengajak pengguna media sosial untuk melakukan survei dasar yang itu sangat mudah untuk dilakukan dan dari situ kita membuat satu sistem pelaporan yang kemudian ditampilkan ke dalam peta secara real time. Begitu juga dari pemerintah dapat melakukan pelaporan ke dalam peta bencana yang sifatnya untuk memverifikasi laporan dari masyarakat. Dan kedua metode tersebut dapat digunakan untuk alat pendukung pengambil keputusan di saat respon bencana. Behind the interface, our open source software listens to social media for posts about disasters, effectively converting all of these platforms into a vast information gathering system. Once a keyword is detected, we can programmatically invite users to share more detailed reports.
Our open source system organizes and displays this information on a free digital map in real time for residents and first responders. We also automatically integrate information from various government agencies, including infrastructure performance data and official disaster updates to create a comprehensive map of impact, need, response, and recovery. KI Jakarta, ini dia, sumbernya adalah sumber peta bencana.id, kalau kita lihat ya, ini adalah wilayah DKI Jakarta. Peta bencana.id sangat bermanfaat sekali. Ketika kita mengalami bencana banjir, kita akan sangat membutuhkan uh, bantuan, jadi kita mudah untuk melaporkan uh, bencana banjir yang ada di wilayah kita. Instead of concentrating decision making in a small group, Peta Bencana supports community-led risk reduction and disaster response. And so everyone has free access to the same transparent information through their mobile phones. This enables residents to make decisions and more equally participate in response and infrastructure management through a cooperative process. The collective behavior of people all over the city making informed decisions has a tremendous impact on reducing risk. By decentralizing emergency information and democratizing decision support tools, Bata Benchana helps residents take action to immediately self-organize, helping each other and the community. While we cannot stop the flood, we can help people work together to overcome the challenges of the monsoon. As a soft, immensely scalable form of infrastructure, open source software can be designed to expand exponentially during emergencies in order to process the vast amounts of data in real time, ensuring that everyone stays informed about dynamic conditions. The intense storms that are becoming more frequent and ferocious due to climate change can't simply be contained with more hard infrastructure. For cities to adapt, they need to use their collective intelligence by enabling every resident to participate in a disaster risk reduction, response, and recovery plan. We make all our software and our data free and open so that partner organizations, community groups, and government agencies can also benefit from our real-time reports. We also share our free and open source software with organizations in other countries who can adapt it to their local language and concerns. When they add new ideas, or capabilities, in turn, they share them with other users, meaning we can all benefit from a shared, common infrastructure. Tentu saja setelah mencakup lebih dari 260 juta pengguna di Indonesia, kami ingin merambah ke skala regional, mencakup ASEAN. Kami menyadari bahwa kebutuhan dari masing-masing negara itu berbeda, dan kami yakin bahwa siapa saja itu bisa membantu ke lebih dari 650 juta warga ASEAN. In Indonesia, there's a strong cultural spirit of gotong royong or mutual aid, where people generously come together to support and help their communities. Peta Bencana extends the spirit into digital gotong royong, supporting location-based social solidarity. The willingness to provide support during disasters is not limited to Indonesia alone. We see this throughout the region. In fact, in the Philippines, the same spirit is described as Bani Nahan. By sharing the software and data in an open manner, our aim is to extend the capacities of digital Gotong Royong globally, where software as urban infrastructure can support new forms of social solidarity as we address our most pressing challenges together.
uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation and also uh, for, for the film. Um, and we are moving on uh, by way of, of entering a Q&A. Uh, let me invite uh, Ria Johanna Dukushin, who is a PhD student uh, at Geography uh, at York University's uh, Environmental and Urban Change. Now, Ria's research interest includes climate change vulnerability, adaptations and resilience, particularly uh, in the agricultural and coastal uh, urban sector. Uh, okay, uh, Ria, uh, all yours. Yeah, so thank you very much, Prof. Abidin and Waikar for organizing this event and having me as a discussant in these great presentations by Dr. Nashin and Dr. Teti. So the first thing I want is just a reflection on the problems presented in the video um, just shared by Dr. Nashin and Dr. Etienne. Um, flooding indeed is one of the most pressing environmental issues today, not just in Indonesia, but in many parts of the world. It has become a growing concern with the increased frequency, intensity, and unpredictability of floods. It is important to recognize that a flood environment is not just influenced by climate change, but also by broader social, political, and economic systems. So for instance, um, economic interests for further urbanization and poorly planned development alter the physical environment, which makes those living in cities more vulnerable to flooding. In Indonesia, as social media became a platform for affected communities to share their flood experiences on the ground, it was interesting how Yayasan Peta Bencana utilized this crowdsourced information along with validated data from the government to map disaster events in real time and how it actually allowed faster and more effective emergency response. It's indeed a helpful tool that allows everyone to actively participate in resilience building and reduce risks through greater inclusivity. I also find it very timely given the rapid intensification of typhoons with climate change, which means real-time information is becoming a more important resource to better respond to rapidly changing situations. And with the success of your project, I think it has influenced the development of Mapa Calamidad or Disaster Map Philippines last September 2020, and it has recently been launched at the national level earlier this year. And since before, thousands of Filipinos, um, Filipino residents have already actively shared real-time updates through social media. The problem then was that there was no um, central platform to share real-time posts for easy public access and make timely decisions to respond. And I believe this is the important COP the Mapa Calamidad is currently working on. Furthermore, I'm interested in how Mapa Calamidad will work since if, it, if we think like an archipelago, the Philippines share several characteristics with Indonesia. In terms of geography, both countries are situated in the Pacific Ring of Fire, which makes them vulnerable to frequent earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. They're also among the most vulnerable countries to extreme weather events, according to the 2020 World Disaster Report. And as climate change now is exacerbating their exposure to disasters, this makes them destinations for stronger and more frequent storms. Further, both countries are characterized by a spirit of mutual aid during and after disasters, um, Bayanihan in the Philippines and Gotong Royong in Indonesia. And interestingly, they are also in one of the top countries in terms of social media usage, which creates an ideal environment for developing a real-time information sharing platform in times of disaster. So, as Yayasan Peta Bencana has been launched since 2013, I was wondering how long did it take to mainstream your project what were the challenges in the implementation and how did you address them? I think these are some of the problems that might be encountered by Mapa Calamidad and other similar projects where we might learn from Indonesia experience. Also, I do not know if you know Project NOAA or the Nationwide Operational Assessment of Hazards. Uh, it was then the Philippines flagship um, 
Disaster Risk Reduction Management Program that also provided real-time hazard-specific and area-focused warning during disaster events. However, in 2017, the administration decided to pull them out due to funding issues, which I think somehow shows how the current administration does not value much the contribution of the project in, in um, reducing disaster risk. So I was also wondering how you, you were able to sustain such a big project. Thank you so much, Rhea, um, for those reflections and the questions. I think they're very pertinent. Um, and yes, to, to answer the last question, we did hear with Project NOAA. In fact, we met with some of the founding team to sort of learn what were their challenges as we were um, implementing there to see if there was something that we could learn off of them. Um, I think what, what was really important for us is that um, the management and the maintenance of this platform is by an independent NGO separate from uh, the political fluctuations of a government. And so even though we work in alliance with the government and work with them for, um, you know, in providing this information exchange during emergencies, there is still a level of independence that allows us to um, um, maintain, yeah, maintain some level of independence, which gives us um, a little bit more leverage in sustaining the project. And even though we do have to deal with like changes in leadership and like um, uh, modify sort of our approach slightly or like, um, you know, reintroduce the project every few months, um, by having it maintained by a local team and like an, an independent NGO, that's really made a difference in sustaining the project. Um, another thing when we met with Project NOAA that they um, they actually were really happy to hear that Mapakalamidad was coming in because they said that one of the fundamental points of differences, um, which I also want to point out, is that the thing that makes this platform quite unique is that it doesn't require residents to learn anything new. The software is designed to plug into existing social media challenges, uh, existing social media ch uh, channels, like, like the ones that residents are already using. So like research has shown during disasters, people aren't gonna download a new application. They're not gonna learn something new while they're in an emergency, and, but, but they're already in the Philippines, especially and in Indonesia, actively on social media. And so if we can just redirect their attention on social media, use a software to reroute that into a form of information collection and um, emergency information dissemination that can be very useful. And this is what Project NOAA, um, the people working on Project NOAA, saw as an advantage of Mapa Kalamidad that could probably su sustain it is that um, precisely that it, it, the way the software is built is that it integrates into these existing behaviors. And um, they saw that that would perhaps have a far more sustaining um, impact. Um, in addition to that, um, the software, all of it is open source. So like we can also integrate data from multiple channels. If Project NOAA were to continue again, if they were to able to receive funding or like um, if Rappler's channel, I know they also had like a flood mapping platform um, at some point that was discontinued. But like if those were to reemerge again, um, there is a possibility to exchange data both ways. And I think that what makes the project able to sustain in the long term is that it um, it operates in this like open data and ecosystem, sort of integrating things and practices that already exist. And um, yeah, the maintenance of it is critical. Uh, yeah. Um, I hope that answered some of the questions. I think the other one was about challenges. Oh yeah, well, anyway, thank you very much for answering my questions. Yeah, it was really helpful and very informative. And then also for Dr. Teti, thank you for the great presentation. 
it um, it was a very it was also a very informative topic on disaster and climate change management at the local and national level in Indonesia. Um, they are also almost similar to how the Philippines manage disaster risks. It is recognized that climate governance is a huge challenge for many leaders since climate crisis knows no borders and it affects everyone. As climate change impacts are becoming widespread and rapid, it increases exposures to new types of disasters and areas that were not previously disaster prone also become affected. And worse, it also leads to a chain of events that further damages the people and environment. This showed the urgency to develop adaptation and mitigation strategies to, to deal with its impacts. Local authorities may have an important influence in terms of well-designed urban planning and public transportation, which can be instrumental to achieve emission reductions, but they may also worsen the impacts with the business as usual scenario, which means there is no significant change in policies, economics, or technologies, even with climate change. So this leads me to question, how hands-on is the local government in Indonesia when it comes to urban planning in general? So for instance, in the Philippines, urban planning is primarily privately led to meet uh, the demands of the growing economy and population, particularly in Manila, Private developers initiate the development in city after getting approval from the government. This means that Manila is shaped by the private that further influences development in our country. However, this indirectly, indirectly contributed to a flood environment that disproportionately affect the disadvantaged populations. And I think this is one of the most challenging problems in our country, which is evident aftermath of typhoons. So going back to my question, I wondered how hands-on the local government in Indonesia when it comes to urban planning. And, and this is a question for Bu Teti, right? Yeah, thank you, Abidin. Uh, Ria, thank you for your uh, questions uh, that uh, regarding urban planning in Indonesia in general. Um, the urban planning or urban spatial plans, yeah, uh, it's actually also kind of government-led uh, uh, activities. Uh, then uh, it's less so influenced by a private sector in the context of Indonesia. It is funded fully by the government. It has to uh, the material of it, the technical mater material of it, are uh, uh, has to be consulted to the to the uh, uh, central government. So even the local government. Uh, uh, plans has to get approval uh, material uh, substantially from the central level. That is because they want to be able to control how far uh, uh, the definition of public interest uh, that is contained in that plan uh, is being uh, being put out there. Yeah. Uh, that also means that uh, increasing influence of private sector at the expense of the community uh, the community uh, at large. Uh, can be to a degree uh, measure uh, more balance. Uh, that doesn't mean that there are private sector who try to um, to sponsor uh, the uh, the making of the plan. Uh, so far, uh, as I've seen um, the last couple of months, uh, there are two or three cases that attempt to do that, uh, but not yet uh, not yet successful. Uh, particularly the strong grips on the government. This is uh, <laughs> the situation uh, where the um, uh, where the government have a final say on uh, what to be developed in the area. Up to the point where uh, a spatial plan in Indonesia become a hinder towards the development of a new capital city, as probably Pak Abidin mentioned in the previous meeting that I also attend. <laughs> So uh, 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 the last couple of days uh, when the new capital city is being consulted to the public uh, right now, uh, uh, Indonesian Planning Association, for example, are not invited to that public consultation. <laughs> That's how, uh, how not uh, privately oriented uh, probably our, our plan at this moment. Uh, that could be uh, one thing. <laughs> 
Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Teddy. So I still wanted to ask some questions, but I think we're already running out of time. Anyway, thank you very much again, Dr. Nashin and Dr. Teddy, for answering those questions and for the amazing presentations. And it was a pleasure to have both of you with us today.